I thought, how am I, I can't just keep running from air. You know, I have to do something different. Insanity's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So I decided to write the book, and that's uh, to expose the glass ceiling. You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. Carol Chumney has been an elected Shelby County, Tennessee Circuit Court judge since September 1st, 2022. Before this, she was an attorney in private practice in Memphis, Tennessee. She served 13 years in the Tennessee State House, earning numerous awards. Carol served four years as a Memphis City Councilwoman, standing up against pension and spending abuses by officials. And she made valiant efforts to be elected county mayor in 2002 and Memphis mayor in 2007 and 2009. Welcome to the podcast, Carol. Glad to be on. What does woman of value mean to you, Carol? Well, I thought about that in... um... I think it means being a woman of substance and and character. And in my book, The Arena, One Woman's Story, um, I talk about the values my parents taught me when I was growing up. Um, And those were courage, character, and compassion. And then also, of course, my faith. Um, So I think that's what being a woman um, of value means to me, is having that courage to stand up for things that, for justice, for truth, um, for peace, um, being a woman of um, character, good character, um, ex- showing that, exemplifying that as an example for other people to follow, uh, and being a woman of compassion, which means helping other people um, and caring about people. Well, you certainly represent all of those things. Uh, tell us a little bit about our about the book in the arena, One Woman's Story. Tell us what it's about and why you wrote it. I wrote the book because I, um, when I was a little girl, and I think this kind of gets into your next question, maybe a little bit, but when I was a little girl, my parents didn't, you know, I knew no limits. My parents never said, uh, you can be this, or you can't be that. I know when my mother grew up, it, there were a lot of things women couldn't do. And she wanted to be a lawyer and a politician. I know that because she put it in her yearbook as things that she wanted to do. She didn't get to be either. Um, But uh, as one of her daughters, I've gotten to do both. Um, So they never set any limits on me as a woman, like you can do this or you can't do that. So I guess as a result, it was kind of a shock to me (laughs) when I got into the political arena later. And all of a sudden it was like, you can do this job, but you can't do that job. You can be a state representative, but you can't be a mayor. And because, you know, and I I just thought, well, how am I going to change this? Because I did try to run for mayor more than once. I ran for county mayor in 2002 and came in second in the democratic primary i came i ran for city mayor of memphis in 2007 came in a very close second to the incumbent mayor i'm the closest a woman's ever come to being elected mayor of memphis and we still have never had a woman mayor and then i when he quit a year and a half later saying he ran only to stop me from being the mayor uh, I ran again because I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be punked out like that. So, and then I came in third, you know, so um, I thought, how am I, I can't just keep running from air. You know, I have to do something different. Insanity's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So I decided to write the book and, um, and that's uh, to expose the glass ceiling. It's interesting that you were brought up with no limits, like you can do anything, because so many people are not. So many people, either their parents might believe in them, but society doesn't. Society is there and other people are there to kind of knock people down. And so you kind of kept trying until you realized, let me do something that I can do here, that I can make a difference with. And so tell us, and that leads us to the next question of the aha woman of value moment, that moment where you recognized that you were of value and you could do big things. As a woman of value, well, when I got to the state, the first office I was elected to was the state house, Tennessee State House. And that was at the age of 29. 
and once again, knowing no limits, you know, I was one of 13 women out of 99 in the state house. So I was like, I'm, I don't know if I'll get reelected. I'm going to try to do what I promised in the campaign. So uh, they wrote a story in the local newspaper about how I was passing more bills than any other freshman. And I wasn't doing what you were supposed to do as a freshman is be seen and not heard. You're supposed to sit there and be quiet, and learn the process. And I was like, no, I'm going to pass this. I'm going to pass that. I'm going to amend your bill. I'm going to. So, um, and I think when I really realized what I could do as a woman of value, it was, it was years, uh, several years later when I passed major child care reform in the state of Tennessee. And that was at a time where I'd even considered leaving the legislature because I was just like, you know, I didn't feel like I was ever going to move up to a chairman, you know, to a different, to a higher position. I'd been um, House Majority Whip. Um, I became the first woman standing uh, uh, chair of a standing committee in, uh, well, the second woman in the history uh, for the state house. And I chaired the House Children and Family Affairs Committee, but I didn't see any path to greater leadership beyond that. And I was I, I seriously considered quitting. But then these two babies died um, in a daycare van on a hot summer day in Memphis. They were left there in the van to die. Two different vans, two different daycares. And so uh, I ended up uh, nobody wanted to address daycare reform because a lot of politicians and religious leaders uh, were had daycare interest. And so I ended up uh, filing a daycare reform package when nobody else would touch it. And it was the main the main legislation that year in the year 2000 and after many many difficult days and lots of work and i did get other people to come on board and help and we passed it and i think that was when i first realized number one why god had put me there um uh, he wanted me to do that to help protect the kids and number two that um standing up for truth justice um, we need leaders who are willing to do that, even when it's not easy. And when I filed that package, I really thought that was the end of my political career because nobody else wanted to do it. And I really felt I would be, you know, outcast um, by a lot of political and religious leaders. But it ended up being like probably the best thing I've ever done. And it all worked out fine. And it helped kids. Wow, that's pretty amazing. I think, you know, when you really believe in something, you don't back down. I mean, I, I have seen that in my own life, that it's so easy to listen to other people who say, you know, just stop. You're working too hard. It's obvious that you're not going to get anywhere. And you, if you believe, you know, you got to do your best, even if it doesn't end up being exactly what you hoped for. And, and it did in the end, which is a great thing. Yeah, you know... Um... I'm thankful for the position I have today, which is a judge, but I even write about this in the book. It really never was my dream, you know, and, um, but I'm thankful for the job and I feel like I'm doing a, 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 a very good job as a judge, but, um, you know, my dream was really to be a leader uh, in higher office, to be the mayor, maybe the U.S. Senator, maybe president, you know, you're not supposed to say that, but when I was a little girl, nobody told me I couldn't do any of those things, and so it was a shock to me, and when I, still today, and that's why I wrote the book, because it's not just about me being the mayor, uh, it's about uh, our woman being the mayor of Memphis. Uh, we've never had a woman governor. We've never had a, a female state co constitutional officer in Tennessee. And we've never had a female president of the United States of America. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done in our country. And that's one reason I wrote the book, because I wanted to expose the glass ceiling, because as I say, you have to see it to defeat it. And what that means is that if you can't see it, they say it's a glass ceiling because you can't see it. And everybody's like, oh, she's doing a great job, but oh, well, she just didn't quite make it. But actually there is a barrier there. So the point of the book was to expose it um, and show with the show and tell with newspaper clippings and articles from 25 years that I kept that when you, I was running for one position, it was like, oh, she's the best thing since sliced bread. Then when I was running for mayor, it was like, I was marginalized 
and uh, and and I was able to document it with actual newspaper clippings and stories. And that was the point behind the book. As long as you stayed in your lane, you were amazing. And if you tried to get <laughs> out of right. your lane, forget it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But you true. still didn't back down. You still, you still like keep going. And so, what gives you the courage to just keep keep at it? I don't know. I mean, I think that I just always believed in myself. And I just, and also I was just like, I'm not going to, I realized also, and another reason I wrote the book, and I realized in life that if you don't define yourself, other people will define you. And it may not be the way you want. And so I thought about it and I thought for me to have a chance in politics again, after the what they did to me and some of those elections with the, with the way they tried to marginalize my record, I thought I have to define myself and let people know who I am and what I've accomplished. And so by writing the book, it was, it, it was hard for them then to define me differently. And one thing I did is at the beginning of the book, I didn't have time because I was trying to get that book out at a certain date. And, um, but to, to apply for some awards and I did win some awards with the book, but I didn't have time to run around and get people to read it and give me reviews. So what I did was I took the actual newspaper quotes and put them at the front of the book of all the good things they said about me when I passed child care reform. And when I did this and when I did that, it, those were my reviews at the front of the book. So it made it really hard for them after that to define me differently because I defined myself. I love that. I, you know, I think that um, when I got divorced and I became a life coach, I had a lot of naysayers, even in my family, like you can't make it doing this work and you should just get a job where you can get health care and go work at Starbucks, be a barista, like just oh, do no. something, <laughs> yeah. you know, make yourself smaller, but do something that's safer for me. That's basically the message is don't make me uncomfortable with your choices. And yeah. because I believed in creating change in other people's lives, and I, I really believed in the work, I just kept at it and kept figuring out how do I make money doing this because I love it so much. And eventually it works. But if you give up because other people say you can't, then you'll never know. And you'll never know how much you can accomplish and how many lives you can impact by the work you do. That's, mm -hmm. I agree with you 100% because and, and so many people don't follow their dreams and then later in life they regret it and I even remember you know I'm a lawyer too and I remember I, I worked at this big law firm and one of the senior partners came up to me and said you know I really wanted to run for office but I never did and it's just like if you don't um, try I'm not saying you're going to succeed. Like, you know, a lot of people want to be an NBA professional basketball player. <laughs> that, you know, you may not make it. You need to have a plan B. But if you don't try to reach your dreams, you're never, you're definitely not going to reach them. And so, and I think the thing, I wanted a book that any, any young girl or any woman could read and men too, I hope they'll read it anywhere in the world and, and understand the message that two messages are really a have in the book and one was about the glass ceiling and giving women a chance an equal opportunity because as i tell people women it's not about voting for a woman uh it's about voting for the best person and so many times the best person is a woman but i think women some women and men don't they feel you know they don't feel like they they feel they're holding women to a higher standard. Uh, and a lot of times the woman is the most qualified. So I'm saying just vote for the best qualified person. The second point in the book was integrity in politics because, um, you know, so many times, and, you know, nobody's perfect, including me, but so many times issues would come up in politics and we need leaders who are going to speak truth to power and who are going to stand up for what's best for people. It's so easy in politics to get um, ingrained in the system, maybe get hang out with the lobbyists too much, maybe um, get conflicting business interests, uh, that interfere with your ability to truly represent the people who got you where you are. 
And so that was what the book was about as well. And you do pay a price. I tell one thing I say in the book and one of my sayings is if you do the right thing, you may catch hell in the short run, but it always works out in the long run. Yeah. And if you set out trying to please everyone, you basically are just a people pleaser. You're not really stating your opinion. You're not really stating who you are. You're just trying to please. And so I think anytime somebody really speaks up about something, you're going to get pushback, especially we have social media. Everybody has an opinion about something, even if they haven't really understood the point you're trying to make. But I agree. I think I think it takes it takes courage to speak up. But it also like there's a point where you can't not speak up. I mean, I feel like that's you. Like, mm -hmm. you, you know, it's bubbling up inside you and you had to write this book. Yeah, well, it's like you look around, you're like, are you going to speak up? Are you, you going to speak up? Are you going to speak? <laughs> no, I guess I am. The only one right. left. <laughs> so you have to do it. Yeah. But I mean, it's just part of it. So yeah, yeah. If, if you're going to do it right, because at the end of the day, I want to be able to look at myself. When I wake up, I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror and feel good about who I am. So if I'm not standing up for the truth, speaking truth to power and trying to make the best decisions I can with those values in place, I'm not going to like who I am at the end of the day. And none of it's worth it. You know, it's not worth yeah. it. So I'm curious about something. Uh, do you have children? No, I, I, I yeah, you're, I see you're a life coach and maybe you can give me some pointers, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, um, I, I wanted to, and I wanted to get married and everything. I just still looking for the right guy. So it just hasn't materialized for me yet, but I feel like I'm on the right track now. So <laughs> <That's good. laughs> maybe I'll have an announcement soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, I, you know, it's an, an interesting thing that I've I've had many clients as a dating and relationship coach who are women of power. And I find that they struggle probably more than any other woman mm -hmm. because their bar for a relationship is usually pretty high and yeah. they want to have equality. A lot of men who they meet are not comfortable with a woman having so much power you have to have a pretty secure guy. And yeah. the other part that I think they struggle with is focusing too much on being kind of your work self in a dating situation. Mm -hmm. And so knowing, I mean, I, I struggle with this myself. I just turning off the, the work part of me because I'm so excited about the work I do. I was just like, okay, I'm on a date. Let's talk about something fun. Let's go bowling. <laughs> Let's, you know. You're right. You're right about that. And I yeah. think, um, I did an Enneagram recently and learned a lot from that and that it is important to turn that off when you're, um, when you're socializing some, and I have a lot of friends and, um, good people, but I think another thing that happens sometimes when you're in politics is that people come at you and tried, and it sounds paranoid, but they do try to set you up. And I've always tried to be very careful about who, I, you know, let into my house who I, you know, spend certain amounts of time with because you don't, if you cannot trust them, then, you know, they, they can create a problem for you. And I even had a, um, a campaign and I talk about it a little bit in the book where, um, you know, there was more than one effort, um, you know, and I'm trying to think, uh, I found out that a, um, uh, my videographer for the campaign was a former FBI, uh, <laughs> a former FBI agent, and just by a fluke of events, and I, uh, I had a um, um, somebody try to get me to do a yard sign location, and for a billboard, and I went and researched it and found out that it was somebody connected with the topless dancing industry. <laughs> then I had a, then I had a. Then I had a um, uh, a, a guy I knew who's a lawyer, who's a good guy, but he was referring me a case. And uh, so they sent me a deposit check and I went to meet with the the lady. I'm not going to say any details about it. And, uh, but anyway, it didn't, it sounded, didn't sound right to me, you know? And uh, so I went back to the office and I mailed it. I didn't cash it. I mailed it back. And I was talking to a friend that night on the phone and I'm like, yeah, so-and-so, uh, tried to hire me and uh but I sent the check back and my phone went dead I really think that I was being 
wiretapped and it wow. was a setup it was a setup so um so those are those kind of things make you a little leery about just like going out with anybody you know you, I, and plus but i've gotten really good at researching so it, there's not much that gets past me now <laughs> yeah it sounds like you do your due diligence about right everything. yeah yeah right you have to I, i'm watching yeah. the sopranos now for the first time and oh my god have yeah. you ever watched that I uh, know I, 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 maybe once, but not, not really. Yeah. It's so. fascinating because you don't know who's your friend and who's your enemy and people turn on each other. And then the, the FBI is in, you know, is colluding with the mafia and the cops are good. Some are bad. So, you know, it's just like, how, who do you trust? And yeah. it's kind of the dating life is like that as well. Like you don't know who people are and you have to be careful. I mean, safety first but if you have too much of a guard up you don't end up meeting or relating that's to anybody. true <laughs> I, had, I had to learn that i had to learn you know to just have to open up a little bit and um, and also ask more questions of other people try to find out more about them so yeah yeah, yeah. curiosity yeah. is totally key yeah. here all, all right. right well let's get back to your work life <laughs> yeah I, the reason i asked about kids is because part of your dream is to be a um, to, is to influence young women and to right and to be a good example. So I was wondering if you had daughters and and if you had no, any but um I do have older parents I take care of right now. <laughs> so, ah. but, but uh but no but you know um one time I was praying about that and like God uh, it was right before the child care reform stuff came through and uh, happened and I was praying about it. It was like God um what's the deal here? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't have a husband. I don't, I don't have any kids. What's the deal? And uh, and that's when I, I was thinking about quitting. It. And there was a verse in the Bible that I kind of came to, which was uh, what you directed me to, which was about you're going to have more kids than anybody else. I don't know. Uh, can't think off the top of the, the my head that verse. Like you'll you'll have more the bear, the woman without kids will have more kids than anybody else. And I really felt like that was God telling me then the child care stuff happened. And I really felt that's what he wanted me to do. So basically it was your, your, I have a lot of kids. They're just not my biological kids. They're the kids yeah. that I help, you know, with my work. So. And that's, that's a big yeah. thing. I mean, there are yeah. plenty of parents out there who should not be parents as, as evidenced in some of these daycare situations. I think we need to reframe what it is to be single, what it is to be married. I mean, people put mm. these labels on people. And if you, you're somehow flawed, if you don't have what society deems as important or socially accepted. And I think part of what I've learned over the years is to, is to really just be so much more compassionate towards others and to know everybody has a story. Like we don't, people who are single, it's not always because they can't have a relationship. It's not right. because they're incapable. It's all kinds of reasons. And people don't have children for all kinds of reasons. And so we have to really work at stop judging, stopping. The Absolutely. Judgment. Well, that's what I believe, you know, don't judge. And then it's pretty clear. I feel like from my religious perspective, and I know everybody's different in the Bible that not everybody is meant for that. And mm -hmm. actually, if you think of the, for me, if you think of the, like a lot of the disciples, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that they had kids, you know, certainly Jesus didn't, Paul, um, other disciples. Um, so even Paul said that it's not for everybody. So uh, every, it's not it meant for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. that wasn't the plan for everybody. So I right. think there's no reason to judge people for it at all. If you have ever played small to make other people feel comfortable, or maybe stayed in a bad relationship or job too long because you didn't think you could do any better, I wrote a book for you. It's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. Each of the 30 chapters contains a life lesson, a story, and an exercise to bring you closer to reaching your full potential. Becoming a Woman of Value is available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. Tell us a little bit about the work you're doing today. Well, um, I'm a trial judge in Tennessee. I was elected countywide uh, in 2022. Um, and, you know, Memphis has a, like, it's about a 1 million plus metropolitan region here. Um, so the cases we hear um, are, I'm a, I, I have jury trials and bench trials, automobile accidents, uh, divorces, 
uh, child custody, personal injury, breach of contract. Um, I hear minor settlements. I hear, um, you know, all kinds of, of litigation cases um, that it's all civil. The only time it ever gets to be criminal is if somebody violates an order. Then I have to turn on a criminal hat and arraign them if it's criminal contempt and have a, a trial, appoint them an attorney if they, if they need one. And I do have those as well, but it's primarily civil cases. Hmm. Yeah. So what about the future? What, what is your dream? I know you had big dreams. Tell us what's your dream for the future. Well, that's an interesting question because, um, you know, I never really gave up my dream, you know, my dreams, but I'm in a different place now. I don't feel like I have to achieve them. I think I've achieved a lot just by the work I've done in the past, writing the book and being elected judge and doing this job. So I don't feel like I have anything to prove uh, in my life, but I'm still young enough to do more. So um, what I'm focusing on right now is getting, you know, getting the word out about my book and the message, doing a good job as a judge and and just seeing if there's a, another door that opens down the road or not. And if not, that's fine. But, um, you know, if it does, I'll take a look at it. But I think for being uh, running for mayor, you know, I tried so hard and um we had some women run this time, this last election cycle, and they got less than 5%. So there's still, <laughs> there's still some work to be done here in Memphis. Um, and Nashville's only had one woman mayor and, and um, in their history, and we still never had a female governor. We have one female U.S. senator, but that she was the first. But there's a lot of work to be done still in that area. So... Um, you know, I feel like if I were to, to consider something else, it would have to be something I felt I had a pretty good shot at. So sounds like you're you've made peace with all that you've done and you don't feel this yeah. need to constantly prove. And no. I like that. That's that's like a, it sounds very peaceful at peace. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think sometimes at the frenetic pace that I kept most of my life where I was on this this trajectory to create, 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 produce, produce, produce. And I'm so much more relaxed about it now. Like it's just, mm -hmm. it's such a nice place to be. So I can relate to that. Um, mm -hmm. But you're still not, you're not done. <laughs> I can tell that. No, no, I'll probably write another book too. And I mean, <laughs> be, I, I, you know, I don't, I get bored. So, I mean, I have to have new challenges or I would just, you know, so I, that's the whole thing. It's just, what is it? What, what is the next challenge? I don't know right now, but yeah, but um, you'll see it. You'll there'll be one. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there'll be one somewhere. Yeah. So. All right. We're going to enter the lightning round now. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. I used to think I wasn't blank enough. Oh, well, good enough, obviously. <laughs> I mean, good enough. I think I think everybody goes through that where you feel you're not good enough. And then, you know, you, you come to revolution where you, you realize, like I said, you have to define yourself. You know? Yeah, so, for sure. And don't comp try not to compare. Uh, compare and despair is what we say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, next, next question. What was the number one thing holding you back from becoming a woman of value? Well, that's an interesting question because I would just say being a woman, <laughs> <laughs> woman of value. Okay. Being a woman of value, there's, there's nothing that can hold you back from that. I don't think, I mean, I, I think you just have to believe in yourself and I always did. So I think I was a woman of value, whether other people at times saw it or not. You believed in yourself and you were a woman. So yes. you had to prove yourself extra, extra hard. Right. Yeah. I'm sure That's, you did too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's pretty crazy. I, I was, you just reminded me of a time when I had something wrong with my car and I brought it in to get fixed and the insurance had approved something. And the person who fixed it was a man and he did not do what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to replace a door and he just fixed it and the insurance paid for the full door. And I, knew that he was lying and I called him on it and he called me crazy. He called, he talked about me behind my back. 
Part of the reason I do what I do today is because I wanted to empower women to learn how to find their voice and to not let men intimidate them. And so these little things that happened to us in our past are really important because they give us, they can motivate us. They can empower us to do better. Well, I will tell you something. My mo- I, somehow I thought about my mother when you were saying that, and she was she never let the men intimidate her ever. Still today, I mean, you know, she's not going to let anybody intimidate her, and that was a great example for me of seeing a woman like that, even though she came from a time where women were supposed to be quiet and, you know, be like be seen and not heard, and uh, she's never been that way, never will. So I think. That was a great example for me. And you never know who else is watching when you do that, that they'll Mm -hmm. get something out of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to say also that it just occurred to me that you're from the South. South is different than the North. I live in the North. And in the South, women have different roles. I mean, I think there's this politeness that we're supposed to have. And, you know, you're supposed to be this this kind of housewifey, you know, (laughs) I I think it's changed over time to a degree, but I think the South, I mean, I grew up in Atlanta and uh, for the first eight years of my life. um, So, uh, you know, traveled a lot in the South and it really is a different feeling for women. I'm just curious if you feel like in the South, it's even harder for women. Um, Yeah, I think that there's a cultural difference. Um, I think that you know, some of it's changed, but obviously not enough because we still can't break through some of those top positions. And I think it's not just in politics, you know, in business. We have seen some changes uh, in business and the, the judiciary has majorly changed since when I was first starting out as a practicing attorney. Uh, there were no, there was like, we elected, had elected like, the first woman judge when I was starting and now I'm a circuit court judge. There are nine circuit court judges in Shelby County and eight of them are women. So that just tells you how far it's come. We just selected the first female chancellor. She's one of three. Um, And we have women on the Tennessee Supreme court. In fact, the courtroom where I serve the Janice Holder used to be, she was the one I was talking about, who I think was like the first or second woman elected a circuit court judge in Shelby County. She served in Division II where I am, and she went on to be on the Tennessee Supreme Court. So we've made gains in certain areas, but other areas, no. So there's a lot of work to be done, and I think in the South, but I'll tell you, okay, look at, um, I don't know what the election status will be when this airs. But I was watching the debate the other night, uh, debates. Um, I watched both sides of politics because as, as a judge, I'm nonpartisan. But I looked at uh, the candidate, Nikki Haley, what she, you know, how, what she was wearing and presented herself. Very different than maybe somebody um, from uh, on the Democratic side. But then again, maybe some of that relates to her being from the South. And from certain those cultural norms, you know, of how you dress, how you look, uh, what you say. So, you know, I guess everybody has to take a look at that and, and still try to do what they want to do. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. totally. Next question. What is the best advice you can give to a woman who wants to become more empowered? Read my book, of course, The Arena One <laughs> Woman's Story. Yes, that'll help you. And um, then also, there's a, a really good book I read. It's called Influence. Really good book. I would rank it as the second best, most important book I ever read in my life. Well, maybe the third after my book, but <laughs> the Bible, my book, and then uh, his book. It talks about how people make decisions and that can really help you. Yeah, that's it right there. You got it. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, it talks about how people make decisions. And it's very important book because it helps you think through as you're going into these different arenas, you know, how you, how you can better enhance your opportunities to succeed. That's all. C-I-A-L-D-I-N-I, Cialdini? Yes. Very good book. Something like that. Right. Uh, Yeah. I remember 
it was recommended to me when I first started my business. Next question. What advice would you give to your younger self? Read that book. Read my book. Maybe listening more. I was a good listener, but maybe you can always improve on being a better listener. Complimenting people more. I think some of those things go a long way. Not that I didn't do it, but that you can always do better at that. What is something that people sometimes get wrong about you? Oh, wow. It's funny how people look at you from their lens. You know, like I had a preacher once and I was running for judge and he goes, oh, you're running for judge and you're a liberal this. And I'm like, I'm not. You know, where did he get that idea? You know, I'm not. I've always been more of a moderate. I'm not a liberal. You know, I'm not liberal. I'm not conservative. I'm, now I'm independent, nonpartisan. But I think people kind of draw assumptions that you're this or you're that and um, try to fit you in a pigeonhole. And not, I'm pretty much an independent and I always have been and always been more of a moderate and you know, so, and I'm a um, logical thinker, but uh, I'm also practical. But, you know, I think that if they try to fit me into this idea of what I am, maybe it's because being a woman, like you said, in politics in the South, that that's a little bit different. So maybe they kind of assume you're a certain way when you're not. So it's their box they're trying to fit you into. That's right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think people do that all the time. And I think when you're a person who's public, like you are, mm -hmm. it's easy for people to make assumptions and get it wrong which is why I like this question. And yeah. finally, Carol, how would you like to be remembered? One reason I wrote the book is um, I really wanted it to stand the test of time. I wanted to write a book of substance that could be useful to people later, even after I'm gone. Um, so that's to me is the most important thing. And of course it has what the work I've done in it. But um, to me, that was that I think that book would be the most important thing for me, you know, because mm -hmm. it not only does it have about what I did, but it also maybe will be helpful to other people. That's what I hope. So, mm. yeah, I'm sure it already has been. Share your website. That's probably the best place for people to find you. www.carolchumney.com. So that's C-A-R-O-L. C H U M N E Y dot com. The book is the the arena one woman story, and it is. I did put my middle initial in, the, in there because I think there's another Carol Chumney floating around somewhere. So okay. it's okay. Carol J yeah. Chumney. Yeah, hey Carol J Chumney. Yeah. So okay. Anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, good luck with the book. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. I loved our conversation about the glass ceiling and, and all that you've accomplished and how many people that you really have influenced to realize that if you dream it, you know, go and go and do it because you're the only one who can who can really achieve your dreams. Don't let other people tell you you can't. That's true. And I also want to thank everybody that helped me along the way. It certainly wasn't a solo effort. And um, also God who helped uh, open doors for me along the way and close bad ones too. So I'm <laughs> thankful for that too. Yeah. Yeah. Closing, <laughs> closing and opening, going through the That's window right. if you have to. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you're, you're very inspirational. Well, thank you. You are too. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. And thanks everybody for listening. If you love our show, please give us a high rating and review on Apple Podcasts and be a woman of value. If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, please share it with others. Because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.